um, which says that auxin quickly activates the expression of specific genes. So that fits in with what we know, right? Hormones as behaving like transcription factors. And then it's the gene products, the products of that gene that's been activate, activated that influence the delivery of new cell wall materials that then affect cell wall extensibility. So in this second hypothesis, the hormones are having uh, a more of an indirect effect. In the acid growth hypothesis, the hormones are having a pretty direct effect on uh, cell wall extensibility. But either way, I have a hunch that they're both true. Just depends on the hormone and the plant. They're probably both happening, but the bottom line is that in both cases, hormones are influencing cell wall extensibility, which influences the ability of that plant uh, to grow, and the ability of cells to elongate. Okay. So hormones are regulating the rate of cell expansion. But hormones are also regulating the direction of cell expansion. And again, this fits into morphogenesis or the overall shape of that adult plant. All right, so I've said this before, but the shape of dividing and enlarging cells determines the ultimate form of, of the developing tissue or organ. So like I've said many times, leaf cells expand in a, in a lateral direction. They expand like this. And so they, they make leaves, plate-like organs, whereas stem cells expand in a longitudinal direction, all right, um, which gives them the shape of a, sort of an elongate vertical stem, all right. So the direction of both uh, cell division here and cell expansion impact the final shape of the cell and therefore the final shape of the organs that that cells are found in, all right? So direction is important. Now here's the deal. I'm gonna set something up and at the end I'm gonna say, pow! This is how hormones are involved, but, but just follow me on this. Okay, uh, differences in the direction of cell expansion are determined by the orientation of cellulose microfibrils. Okay, this is in the cell wall. So the orientation of the cellulose microfibrils in the cell wall are gonna influence the way that that cell expands. So if the cellulose microfibrils in the cell wall are deposited in a random orientation, the cells are gonna expand in all directions, but the overall expansion will be lateral. So if you have random microfibrils in the cell wall, and this is when the cell wall is being developed originally, all right, um, you'll have lateral expansion. If the cellulose microfibrils are deposited transversely, like stacked like this, then the cell is going to expand longitudinally. And that one makes a lot of sense to me um, because, you know, if you've got um, these microfibrils stacked like this and they're sort of compressed, you know, when that thing, when that thing expands, it's going to just be like a coiled spring expanding upward. So that one uh, makes a lot of sense to me. So, uh, so here's here's what we're looking at here. Look, here's the plasma membrane down here. I want you to pay attention to this. There's the cell membrane. Here's the cell wall, and here are these cellulose microfibrils, like little cigars in my picture. Okay, which way are those things oriented? Because that's going to determine the direction of cell expansion. Right, which has huge impacts for the shape of the cell and, and, and plant organs. All right, now here's the thing. The orientation of those cellulose microfibrils <coughs> is governed by the orientation of microtubules lying just underneath them in the plasma membrane. All right, so uh, microfibrils are oriented in a certain way because the microtubules underneath them are oriented in a certain way. So this picture, we can see this pretty clearly. Look, here's a microfibril in the cell wall. Right, look, there's the underlying microtubule in the plasma membrane. Do you see that? Here is, uh, here's a microfibril in the cell wall. Look, there's the microtubule in the plasma membrane. They're oriented parallel to each other. Okay? But here's the payoff. 
The orientation of the microtubules is under hormonal control. So hormones influence the way that the microtubules lie, which influences the way that the microfibrils lie, which influences the direction of cell expansion. Okay, so that's the... So, for example, uh, gibberellins lead to a transverse arrangement of microtubules, which leads to a transverse arrangement of microfibrils, which leads to longitudinal expansion. All right, so that's right here. All right, all we're showing you here are the microfibrils. But look how they're stacked like this. The microfibrils are like this. Because the microtubules are like that underneath them. And then, that's going to be a stem or a root cell, right, under the action of gibberellins. Ethylene, on the other hand, leads to a random orientation of microtubules, which leads to a random orientation of microfibrils, which leads to overall lateral expansion, like something you might find in a leaf cell. Can you see that? Give that flat uh, plate like organ. Okay, so that's just um, that's just sort of explaining a little bit about how uh, hormones are impacting overall shape. So that was a little bit simpler, right? Hormones impact morphogenesis, the shape of a plant, because they can impact the rate of cell expansion and they can impact the, the direction of cell expansion. Okay. And then the bigger thing we talked about here was that hormones can impact gene expression, differential gene expression, by way of all of those mechanisms, short, medium, and long biochemical pathways. Okay, so those are, those are the two major effects that hormones are having in plants, gene expression and morphogenesis. Okay. Um, I want you guys to do this and uh, give it to me before the class is done, uh, before the, the semester is finished. I won't kind of dictate when you when you do, but I want you, and this will only be available to the people that are here in class today, so this will be one of your rewards. Um, so, you know, I said in the first Plant Hormones lecture, you know, the other day, that hormones are active in very small quality, quantities. So given our discussion of molecular mechanisms today. Write me one or two paragraphs as to uh, why this is possible. So this is really, I want you to give me a discussion of the way that the amplification that occurs, right, in these hormone response pathways. That's really what I'm after. How is it that that hormone uh, signals amplified as a part of this, you know, this hormone response pathway? So All right? It's like describing like how are the well, how is it that this very, very small hormone quantity can be translated into this huge cellular response? Um, if you go back to the slide with the POW, the red POWs, POW, that's sort of a, I want you to turn that slide into some paragraphs for me, but that, that'll give you a hint as to where the answer is found. Uh, you know what I mean by the red POWs? Did I say pow? I probably said <laughs> pow. Pow. Uh, for all of you out there in TV land. Pow! <laughs> okay, so that's that. Is that it? No, got one more to go. <laughs> We're doing good. We've been here less than an hour. Sure. That's good. We actually did a little bit more than one lecture, didn't we? We'll finish up that other one. You guys just want to keep going? You want to break? I'll just keep going, Savannah. I could use a water break. Okay, let's take let's take a short break. All right, All right. Five we'll, uh, not long, less than five minutes. Part one of hormones, though because this is on the front end of a hormone response. This is the ways in which plants are receiving environmental information and uh, responding to them. Uh, but hormones are there in the middle of the response. Yeah. So, uh, Why they flip I don't know. The book flips in the back. Sure probably a good point there. I should probably do that one first. Okay, so look. 
we all know this. We learned this in biology 101 that living things uh, are are uh, responding to stimuli. All living things respond to stimuli. Living things are regulating their activities in response to the world around them. Look, animals are mobile, right? They can forage for food. They can court and go after a mate. They can seek out and make shelters. Plants are immobile, but they can respond to their environments by changing their growth patterns. So that's a very common plant response to environmental factors, changing their growth patterns. In fact, two genetically identical plants can have totally different forms. You may not even recognize them as being the same because of uh, differing environmental inputs. Okay. Um, so I want to talk for a little bit about this, uh, this idea or this phenomenon called tropism. And so in plants, a tropism is a growth response involving the bending or curving of a plant toward or away from an external stimulus. All right, and the toward or away is very, very important because later on when we get back from break, we'll talk about a plant response which is not directly toward or directly away from the stimulus. It is a plant response to a stimulus. The plant does something in response to a stimulus, but it's not directly toward or away from the stimulus. Uh, but tropisms are. So a positive tropism is a response toward the stimulus. So we might say that shoots, leaves, and stems are positively phototropic. They bend towards the light, right? A negative tropism is a response away from some stimulus. And so we might also say that shoots are negatively gravitropic, if you think about it, right? stems and leaves are growing away from the force of gravity or against the force of gravity at the same time that they're growing towards the sunlight. <coughs> All right, so shoots are positively phototropic uh, and yet negatively gravitropic. All right, so let's talk about some of these tropisms. So phototropism is the curving of a growing shoot tip towards the light shoot tips tend to do this. Like we talked about this with the Darwins, right, with the, their auction experiments. They saw that coleoptile tips were bending towards uh, sunlight. Now, this is happening because the cells on the shaded side of the tip are elongating more than the cells on the, on the inside of the tip. So check this out. Let's pretend that Joel and the camera are the sunlight, and here's the shoot tip, okay? So the sunlight is hitting this side of the, the shoot. So this is the shaded side on the back. What ends up happening is that under the influence of auxin, the cells on the shaded side elongate where the ones on the inside don't. And if you get elongation on the back side, that's gonna cause a bending, right? It's differential elongation. If cells on both sides were elongating, then the whole stem would just get taller. But if they're only elongating on the back side, then the stem is going to bend towards the light. So differential elongation. Okay, so what does the light have to do with it? How is it that we get this differential elongation? Well, there are several ideas, and these are sort of the, the three basic hypotheses leading up to the discovery. Some people propose that the sunlight decreased the auxin sensitivity on the lighted side. And so the lighted <clears throat> the lighted side um, wasn't elongating because those cells had a reduced reduce sensitivity to the oxides. Um, some people thought that the light actually destroyed the oxins on the lighted side. And other people thought that the sunlight actually drove the oxin to the shaded side, so that there was actually the only place where oxin was found was on the shaded side. Remember, the auxins are causing the cell elongation. So these are the three uh, competing hypotheses. So some people did some uh, experiments there. I'll jump down to the conclusion. The final conclusion was that it was the redistribution of auxins, right? The fact that the auxins were being, <clears throat> were being driven to the shaded side 
that was causing the differential elongation and therefore the bending of the stem uh, towards the light. And, and that the auxins were not